Who gives this woman to this man in marriage? Her mother and I do. Hmm. Thou hast established thy covenant with us and with our children in Jesus Christ. And we have gathered together tonight to see the uniting together of two who by thy grace believe in thee, who believe in Jesus Christ, who trust in thee. The faith that they have is a gift, a gift from thee. And thou hast also guided them to be together. And thou hast given them a desire to be united together as one. We love them. We ask thy blessing upon them. It's with joy that we see them united tonight. Uh, we are thankful for the joy that they have together. And we rejoice with them. May this be a joyful occasion throughout this night. May our conversation and all that we do be to thy honor and glory. Forgive, O oh Lord, our sins. Keep us from sin. And bless thy people and all nations for Christ's sake. <coughs> Amen. Whereas married persons are generally, by reason of sin, subject to many troubles and afflictions, to the end that you... Michael Lanning and Alyssa Huber, who desire to have your marriage bond publicly confirmed here in the name of God before these witnesses, may also be assured in your hearts of the certain assistance of God in your afflictions. Hear therefore from the word of God how honorable the marriage state is, and that it is an institution of God which is pleasing to him. Wherefore he also will, as he hath promised, bless and assist the married persons, and on the contrary, judge and punish whoremongers and adulterers. In the first place, you are to know that God our Father, after he had created heaven and earth and all that in them is, made man in his own image and likeness, that he should have dominion over the beasts of the field, over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air. And after he had created man, he said, it is not good that man should be alone, I will make him in help meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Therefore ye are not to doubt, but that the married state is pleasing to the Lord, since he made unto Adam his wife, brought and gave her himself to him to be his wife, witnessing thereby that he doth yet, as with his hand, bring unto every man his wife. For this reason, the Lord Jesus Christ did also highly honor it with his presence, gifts, and miracles in Cana of Galilee, to show thereby that this holy state ought to be kept honorably by all, and that he will aid and protect married persons even when they are least deserving of it. But that you may live godly in this state, you must know the reasons wherefore God hath instituted the same. The first reason is that each faithfully assists the other in all things that belong to this life and a better. Secondly, that they bring up their children, which the Lord shall give them in the true knowledge and fear of God to his glory and their salvation. Thirdly, that each of them, avoiding all uncleanness and evil lusts, may live with a good and quiet conscience. For to avoid fornication, 
Let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband, insomuch that all who are come to their years and have not the gift of continence are bound by the command of God to enter into the marriage state with knowledge and consent of parents or guardians and friends, so that the temple of God, which is our body, may not be defiled. For whosoever defileth the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Next you are to know how each is bound to behave respectively towards the other according to the word of God. First, you who are the bridegroom must know that God hath set you to be the head of your wife, that you, according to your ability, shall lead her with discretion, instructing, comforting, protecting her, as the head rules the body, yea, as Christ is the head, wisdom, consolation, and assistance to his church. Besides, you are to love your wife as your own body, as Christ hath loved his church. You shall not be bitter against her, but dwell with her as a man of understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, considering that ye are joint heirs of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And since it is God's command that the man shall eat his bread in the sweat of his face, therefore you are to labor diligently and faithfully in the calling wherein God hath set you, that you may maintain your household honestly and likewise have something to give to the poor. In like manner must you who are the bride know how you are to carry yourselves toward your husband according to the word of God. You are to love your lawful husband, to honor and fear him, as also to be obedient unto him in all lawful things as to your Lord, as the body is obedient to the head and the church to Christ. You shall not exercise any dominion over your husband, but be silent, for Adam was first created and then Eve to be in help to Adam. And after the fall, God said to Eve and in her to all women, your will shall be subject to your husband. You shall not resist this ordinance of God, but be obedient to the word of God and follow the examples of godly women who trusted in God and were subject to their husbands. As Sarah was obedient to Abraham, calling him her Lord. You shall also be a help to your husband in all good and lawful things, looking to your family and walking in all honesty and virtue without worldly pride that you may give an example to others of modesty. Michael and Alyssa have asked me to speak on Ephesians 5 and also 1 Corinthians 13. I'll first read from Ephesians 5, starting at verse 22 to verse 33. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, for he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And then from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 13, and I will read that using the, the word love where the King James has charity. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. 
Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love. These three, the greatest of these is love. The time Michael and Alyssa has come, you've planned for quite some time to be joined together. You've traveled a distance back and forth for quite a while. And tonight you will drive away from here as, as one flesh. And we're thankful to God for that. We see the joy that the two of you have. We see how much that you enjoy being together. And we see how you enjoy to talk to one another and how you, well you work together and how you have fun together. And we're thankful to God for that. There's also a great joy here tonight of your families. To see the two of you marry in the Lord, we are happy to see this. We are thankful for the, the two of you. We have joy, there's a great joy uh, and perhaps it will happen someday for the two of you, if the Lord grants you children, that the day will come when you will see your children marry in the Lord, and what a, what a great joy that, that is. And it's a joy also as we think of all the children and grandchildren that may come forth uh, from the two of you in the providence of God, which we know not, but we think of uh, how God blesses us in our generations, and we're so thankful for the gift of, of children. And we look forward, you know, to covenant children according to, according to the, the will of our God. God's covenant. Marriage is, when we think of marriage, when the scriptures speak to us of marriage, we're reminded of the truth concerning the covenant. The covenant union that there is between God and his people, the covenant union that there is between Christ and his bride, the church. And that covenant, as you know, is, is friendship. It's an unconditional bond of friendship. And marriage reflects that. God swears an oath. He could swear by no greater. He swears by himself, and we become his. We belong to him, and we confess that he is our God, and we are his people, and we have fellowship together. Tonight, the two of you make a vow, and once you have become married, you belong to one another so that Alyssa, you become Mike's, Michael's wife. And Michael, you are Alyssa's husband. And that's exclusive, an exclusive union. And that you remember that always, wherever you go. Michael, that you are Alyssa's husband. You are her man. And that you are Michael's wife and that the two of you are devoted to one another. 
in your thinking, that you are devoted to one another, that you are desiring uh, the good of one another, and that you are expressing your love for one another. And that union that God establishes is lifelong. And you both confess that, and it's a joy to hear you confess that, that it's lifelong. God brought you together, even as we read that what God hath brought together, joined together, let not man put asunder. And all the, the two of you, in God's providence, you know, were brought together, and there's a lot of discussion about how that is, and with each relationship it's different. But this, you know, God brought you together in the providence of God. And God brought you together to the point where you desired to be married together. And very quickly, as the two of you found one another, remember seeing early on a picture of the two of you and that you could see the happiness in the two of you. And very quickly, you were talking about marriage. It didn't take very long before you were already talking about being united together. God is the one who did that. God is the one that has worked within you. And he who, when he joins you together, let not man put asunder. He joins you together and you're married for life. And you confess that. Many people don't. But by the grace of God, you do. And you're thankful that the other one does as well. Uh, a one flesh union, a friendship. You will live with your friend and you go through, you know, you go through happy times, and we've, we've heard you laugh together and enjoy time together. You go through sad times, and as you go through them, be thankful to God that you have with you, very close to you, your friend. That you are marrying your friend, your sister, your brother in the Lord, your, your friend, your dear friend. And that one flesh union is a, is a close friendship, communion. And so when the wife is told to submit, she's told to submit to her friend, to a friend who loves her, who is watching out for her. And you do so in the consciousness of the fact that God directs you through Michael, as he has through your parents, so also now through, through Michael, that he gives you direction. And that, Michael, you view Alyssa as she is once you are married as love that she is one flesh with you. He who loves his wife loves himself, even as we read. And that you watch over her and to comfort her and protect her. You think of how her parents have done that. They've watched over Alyssa. They've cared for her. They've instructed her. And now, you are the one to watch over her. It's still the case that parents, after their children marry, they give advice, and they, they, they talk together and they, about various things, and have communion and fellowship together. Yet, this relationship, the husband-wife bond, takes precedent over the parent-child bond. A man leaves his father and mother He's joined to, he cleaves to his wife, and they two are one flesh. And you two get to know one another more than your parents have known you. There may be things, even years down the road, that you find out from your father and mother-in-law that you didn't know about your spouse, and yet at the same time, as you grow, you grow more and more to know one another better than your parents knew you. A very intimate fellowship, communion together, one flesh. And you vow to love. And that's what you desire the other one to do. It's certainly, Michael, your thoughts towards Alyssa is your desire is that Alyssa would always love you. And you know, Alyssa's desire is that you would always love her. 
and the problems that arise at various times, and they will, they already have, you already have times where you have difficulties, and often they can be about very small things, but you don't agree on them, and you want things the way that you want them, and you try to convince the other one that your way is better, and it doesn't go so well. And sometimes you may say something that's, that offends the other one. There's various ways, various situations that you do have difficulties, and yet you've worked. You've worked through them. God has guided you. It could have been that you had decided, well, it's not working out, and just go your separate ways. But you didn't want to do that. You wanted to stay together, and you worked through it. And that's the work of the spirit within you, that you knew this is the right one and you're going to work through it. And so also going forward, working through things, recognizing your own <clears throat> selfishness, envy, the things that love is not, we see in ourselves. Love doesn't envy, love vaunteth not, it's not puffed up, we see our own pride. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. We can see our own selfishness. We had see at times that we're not slow to anger like we ought to be. True love shows itself and is characterized by not being proud, being humble, and not selfish. Thinking the best of the other one. And well, you, you both have a sinful nature as we all do, and yet God guides you to see your own sin. And in the problems that arise, when you keep your eye on that, not just on the fact that there's a difficulty and you're upset that the other one doesn't see it the way you do, or you're upset about what the other one may have said to you, that you consider the fact that in the providence of God you have this difficulty. Why? Who's teaching you? The Father, your Father in heaven who brought you together is the one that's teaching you. And you know that. And that will come to your mind. Not just what the difficulty may be, but you'll be thinking, why in the providence of God do we have this misunderstanding, disagreement, or whatever it is. And you listen to what God is teaching you. And you go to the scriptures together, which the two of you do, and that is a great joy to, to see. How much you talked together about the word. And that I've been able to hear that in the room right next door to my study, I can hear the two of you having devotions together. And that is a great joy to see, to see the two of you, seeing you, I can hear you out, out outside the room also laughing and playing games together. And I see you working together, uh, thankful for one another, and how you like to discuss the word together. God will guide you going forward while you'll learn together, talking together about the Word. Remind one another about what the Word says. As you see one another, one another may be worried, one another may be down, that you bring up the Word to one another. And what a joy to have a friend very close to you it keeps bringing up to you the Word of God and encouraging you with what God says, that God is with you, that God will guide you, even as we read that he aids and protects believing persons in marriage. And you know that. You know he's guided you up to this point, and you know he will guide you going forward. You need his grace. You go to the Word together. You go 
to God together also as you pray. And you keep praying to God for the grace and the guidance that you need for wisdom. And Michael, you'll see your need for wisdom. You already do. But there'll be other difficulties that you will face that will, and you will be reminded of your need for wisdom, your need for patience. You need the grace of God. Pray to him. The two of you pray together. And God, God hears your prayers. He will. He has been. He's heard your prayer undoubtedly that the Lord would bring you to someone who loves the Lord and that you would have a marriage where you were united together in Christ and united as husband and wife. And he has brought the two of you together. He has heard your prayer. He's heard your parents' prayers too, and he will be hearing our prayers going forward. Many pray for you, and the Lord will hear our prayers and will guide you and will strengthen you. And if the Lord grants you children, that you patiently rear them as those who are sinners yourself, saved solely by God's grace, unconditional salvation, unconditional election. Christ died for you, for his people, and you confess that. And as those who know that you don't deserve it, and it's all of God's grace, to be patient with the children that the Lord may give you and to rear them in the fear the fear of God, and to teach them. You think of what parents vow when they baptize, have a child baptized, that they will instruct them in the doctrine. Instruct them in all the doctrine that's set forth in this book. That brings out to you, Michael, the importance of you continuing to grow to learn, to study, that you may be able to teach your children. Uh, and that the two of you be searching the scriptures together and instructing your children and thank God for the covenant that he makes not only with us, but he makes with our children as well. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord strengthen you. May you together in your life glorify your God. May others see in you an example of a godly marriage of two that forgive one another, of two that show their esteem for one another, that when others see you and they see your marriage, that they recognize your love for one another. May the Lord grant that. May you continue to grow. And may you express your thankfulness to God for all the blessings that he has bestowed upon you. At this time, we are going to sing, O Perfect Love. And the words are in the, are in the insert, O Perfect Love.
are for you, Michael, and you, Alyssa, having now understood that God hath instituted marriage and what he commands you therein, are you willing thus to behave yourselves in this holy state as you here do confess before this Christian assembly and desirous that you be confirmed in the same? Yes. I take you all who are met here to witness that there is brought no lawful impediment. Since then it is fit that you be furthered in this your work, the Lord God confirm your purpose which he hath given you and your beginning be in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Before God and these witnesses, I ask you to make your vows to one another. Michael, repeat after me. I, Michael, take you, Alyssa. I, Michael, take you, Alyssa. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better or worse. For better or worse. For richer or poor. For richer or poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to honor. To love and to honor. Till death do us part. To death do us part. Alyssa, repeat after me. I, Alyssa, take you, Michael. I, Alyssa, take you, Michael. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better or worse. For better or for worse. For richer or poor. For richer or poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to obey. To love and obey. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Do you give this ring as a symbol of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? I do. Alyssa, do you give this ring as a symbol of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? I do. According to the laws of this state, and the ordinance of the Church of Jesus Christ, I declare you to be husband and wife. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The Father of all mercies, who of his grace hath called you to this holy state of marriage, bind you in true love and faithfulness, and grant you his blessing. Amen. Michael, you may kiss your bride.
Hear now from the gospel how firm the bond of marriage is, as described in Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Believe these words of Christ. Be certain and assured that your Lord God hath joined you together in this holy state. You are therefore to receive whatever befalls you therein with patience and thanksgiving, as from the hand of God. And thus all things will turn to your advantage and salvation. Amen. Let us pray together.
Almighty God, thou who dost manifest thy goodness and wisdom in all thy works and ordinances, and from the beginning has said that it is not good that man be alone, and therefore has created him a help meet to be with him, and ordained that they who were two should be one, and who dost also punish all impurity, we pray thee, since thou hast called and united these two persons in the holy state of marriage, that thou wilt give them thy Holy Spirit, so that they in true love and firm faith may live holy according to thy divine will, and resist all evil. Wilt thou also bless them as thou hast blessed the believing fathers, thy friends and faithful servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in order that they, as co-heirs of the covenant which thou hast established with these fathers, may bring up their children, which thou wilt be pleased to give them in the fear of the Lord, to the honor of thy holy name, to the edification of thy church, and to the extension of the holy gospel. Hear us, Father of mercy, for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, our Lord, in whose name we conclude our prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hearken now to the promise of God from Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. The Lord our God replenish you with his grace and grant that ye may long live together in all godliness and holiness. Amen. Michael and Alyssa, it was a great joy to officiate at your wedding. We love you both. May the Lord bless you in your married life together. It's my privilege to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Michael Lanning. 